I'm Heather Marie Montia, and you are watching PBS Books. Thank you for joining us. PBS Books, in collaboration with WETA, is pleased to host a conversation with the 2023 Pulitzer Prize winning author Beverly Gage, author of G Man, J. Edgar Hoover, and the Making of the American Sanctuary. PBS Books is proud to partner with the Library of Congress to promote their 2023 National Book Festival. Let's take a moment to hear from the Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden. I'm Carla Hayden, Librarian of Congress, and I want to give a thank you to PBS Books for supporting the National Book Festival. Hope you can join us in Washington and online for this year's festival on Saturday, August the 12th. Well, if you if you live in Washington, D.C. or in the DMV, then don't miss the 2023 Library of Congress National Book Festival. As Dr. Hayden shared, it is on August 12th. It is one day. It's from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. The festival is free and open to everyone. It's a quick drive or a train right away. For the complete schedule, please go to loc.gov slash bookfest. Remember, if you can't be there, you can even stream some of your favorite authors um, from the comfort of your home. The other thing to note is now through August 31st, PBS Books and PBS stations across the country will host a series of 10 virtual events with 11 authors. They will be available on demand on pbsbooks.org and at the National Book Festival website. Well, here is a quick welcome from our station partner. Thank you, Heather. Good evening and welcome. I'm Miguel Monteverdi, Senior Vice President and General Manager of WETA, right here in the nation's capital. I'm thrilled to welcome you to tonight's conversation, a collaboration between WETA, PBS Books, and the Library of Congress. As I'm sure many of you know, the Library of Congress National Book Festival is an annual literary event that brings best-selling authors, poets, and illustrators together right here in the nation's capital with thousands of readers for book talks, panel discussions, signings, and other engaging activities. WETA is proud to support the festival and is committed to sharing the stories of contemporary authors with the DC community. And we are especially proud to be a part of tonight's conversation featuring Beverly Gage, professor of history and American studies at Yale University. Her uh, recent book, G-Man, J. Edgar Hoover and the Making of the American Century not only won the Pulitzer Prize in Biography in 2023, but was the winner of the 2022 National Book Critics Circle Award in Biography, uh, the 2023 Bancroft Prize in American History and Diplomacy. It won the LA, Time, uh, LA Times Book Prize in Biography. It was named a Best Book of 2022 by The Atlantic, The Washington Post, and Smithsonian Magazine. It was awarded a Top 100 Notable Books of 2022 by The New York Times. I could continue to list the awards and accolades, but then we'd have no time left for our, uh, tonight's panel. So I will, I will stop there. Uh, wish uh, uh, Beverly congratulations uh, and enjoy, enjoy the panel. Back to you, Heather. Well, thank you so very much. We're so happy to be able to partner with WETA this year. Today's conversation features Beverly Gage to discuss not only her latest work, but her involvement in the festival. We'll be discussing G-Man, J. Edgar Hoover, and the making of the American Century, which is a major new biography about him. And it draws from the never before seen sources to create a groundbreaking portrait about a man who has dominated history for half a century and has planted seeds for much of today's conservative political landscape. So let's meet the author. Beverly Gage is a professor of 20th century American history at Yale University. Her book, which won not only the Pulitzer Prize this year, it also won the Bancroft Prize in American History, the National Book Critics Circle Award for Biography, LA Times Book Prize in Biography, and many more. G-Man was named a best book of 2022 by the Washington Post, The Atlantic, 
Publishers Weekly, The New Yorker, The New York Times, and The Smithsonian. Gage is also the author of The Day Wall Street Exploded, which examined the history of terrorism in the late 19th and early 20th century. She frequently writes for The New York Times, The Washington Post, The New York Times Magazine, The New Yorker, among many other publications. It's my extraordinary honor to welcome Beverly Gage. Welcome. Thanks. It's great to be here. We are so happy to have you. And I just want to personally congratulate you for winning the 2023 Pulitzer Prize for in biography for G-Man. What a huge accomplishment. And you must be thrilled. How do you feel? Yeah, it was a, it was a big thrill. You know, it's one of those things that uh, writers think about and imagine for a lot of their careers. And then suddenly it happens. So I, I couldn't be happier, especially because I worked on this book uh, for so long, more than a decade. And it's just great to feel that effort pay off. OK, so I know everyone now knows a little bit and the title says what it's about. But can you put in your own words if you had an elevator speech? What is this? What is your book about? Well, it's good to have an elevator speech for this book because it's about 800 pages long, but I hope pretty accessible. Um, and it is a birth to death biography of J. Edgar Hoover, who was the director of the FBI for a pretty astonishing 48 years. So that was from 1924 to 1972, uh, from Calvin Coolidge to Richard Nixon. And it's the story of Hoover and his life. It's the story of many of the things that happened in between those years. And it's in particular a story about Washington, D.C., which is the city where he was born, the city where he died, the city where he had his whole career. So it's particularly great to uh, be coming to the National Book Festival to talk about it. Yeah, that is really exciting. And I, we want to get into that a little bit more and, and learn your thoughts. You know, it's interesting because Hoover died a handful of years before I was born. Um, but I feel that he's not only a bit of a mystery, but there's also mythology around him. He's very controversial. What inspired you to write this book? And you've already shared it's taken, it took you over a dozen years or over a decade. Why, why now? Hoover, as you say, is one of these figures who is shrouded in legend, particularly for people who still have a living memory of him. Um, I was born two months after Hoover died. And so uh, I feel that I personally am very much in this kind of transitional generation that had, had heard of him, had heard of the legend, but didn't have a living memory of him. You know, and I think for the period since his death, he's really been remembered primarily for everything that he did wrong, right? He's been seen as one of the great villains of the 20th century. And my book doesn't try to argue against that. Um, I'm pretty critical of Hoover, but it does try to take him seriously as a political figure and to kind of take him from uh, where he's often depicted in popular culture, which is this marginal figure, someone that nobody really likes, and really put him back in the center of our national story and to point out what I think is maybe the most surprising thing for people about J. Edgar Hoover, which is that during his lifetime, he was actually pretty widely supported. He was a pretty popular figure. Republicans liked him, Democrats liked him, presidents, Congress, right? And he couldn't have had his career without all of that support. Oh, it's an incredible story that you tell. And, you know, the, the theme for the National Book Festival this year is everyone has a story. And I feel like you are telling his story over such you know, over his lifetime. It's so incredibly. Let's talk a little bit. Um, 800 pages might seem intimidating to some. Um, I was recently at a party and someone told me the first thing they do when they get a big book like this is they put in a, um, a bookmark where the notes begin. So it's actually only like 736. <laughs> that's right. That's right. There's a lot of back matter. <laughs> the other thing I want everyone to know, too, and I really like that you did this. Um, well, it's divided into four sections, is it not? Um, can you talk a little bit about those if those if that's OK? 
Yeah, so the book is, you know, a big long book because Hoover lived for a long time and did lots of things. But I did want to make sure that the book was accessible in a way for people to read episodically, right? Very few people sit down and read a book like this from start to finish. And so, as you say, it's divided into four sections and it also has a lot of chapters which are relatively short photos at the beginning of every chapter, kind of signaling about the dates and the thematic nature of each chapter. And that was pretty deliberate too, to try to make it um, accessible despite its, its weight and heft. So part one of the book really looks at Hoover's early years um, from his birth in 1895 uh, to the moment that he becomes director of the Bureau in 1924 at the ripe old age of 29 stays in that job for the rest of his life. And a lot of that's about his roots in Washington, about the way that Washington shaped both his view of government and also his kind of deep social conservatism around uh, issues like race and religion, law and order. So that covers uh, the first period of his life. Part two takes on what I think of sort of the, as the building years, which are from 1924 to 1945, when he's a relatively young director and when he really makes his name as a champion of government reform, government professionalism, science and expertise. I mean, all of these values that we tend to think of as being progressive values or New Deal values, Hoover really comes to stand for that. Uh, the title of the book, G-Man, suggests that it was both a nickname for federal agents, FBI agents beginning in the 1930s, but what it stands for is government man. And uh, Hoover really was a, a government man. And these are the years in which that begins to, uh, to kind of come to fruition. Um, and then the last two sections really cover the periods of his life that I think are probably more familiar to people. Part three looks at the 40s and 50s and particularly Hoover's rise as a devout and passionate anti-communist. Um, and then the 60s and 70s take up the last part of the book when I get into his surveillance of the civil rights movement of Martin Luther King, uh, of the left and, and the politics of the 60s more generally. Well, I'm excited to be able to talk a little bit more about some of those sections, but I do want to tell you what one of the things I like. Now, first thing is I studied art history as one of my few majors in school. So I am biased, but I do love, and I don't know if it was you or who, I mean, some of the images you chose are, right, you have like just the sweetest image of little Edgar. And, you know, and I feel like it sets the tone or you have this, right, for the government men. And it it, it provides um, context and, it, and the, the chapters are really readable. So it makes it something that you feel like, you know, I'm getting somewhere and I'm learning a lot. And I really uh, just want to say I really appreciated that, that even if you don't know a lot, all of a sudden you're learning a lot. And the other thing I want to know is I do love political cartoons and they also, some chapters have them. And I know copyrights are sometimes such, but that was a quick, a quick view. Um, the center also has gorgeous um, black and white images that I really, you've done a tremendous job at, at curating those as well. And I think anyone who, who gets to have your book in their hands will really love them. So as much as um, I know I love audiobooks, um, I also think having one in your hand, you actually get to touch and feel it and see and explore in a, in a, in a different way. Um, okay. So let's, if you could talk a little bit about how Washington DC really influenced the man. I know this is a the million dollar question, but in, influenced who he was and how it shaped him because he was so much a creature of the city. If you could talk a little bit about maybe some real threads of your perception being that he always lived there. Washington was one of the pieces of Hoover's life that fascinated me because we often talk about Washington as kind of a metaphor, right? Washington politics, et cetera, et cetera. But for Hoover, it was both that political world and it was his hometown. It was the place 
uh, that shaped him from the moment that he was born. Uh, he was born there on January 1st, 1895, just a few blocks away from the Capitol, um, right up in Capitol Hill. So for those of you who know Washington today particularly well, um, the Capitol Hill Methodist Church is on the site of Hoover's uh, birthplace, the place that he grew up. Um, and what I think is really interesting about his early years in Washington are, are two aspects. One, is that he comes from a pretty modest family, but it is a family that has already had decades and decades of government service, right? They have worked in uh, basically the federal civil service going back a couple of generations. And that's incredibly unusual in the late 19th century when the, the federal government didn't do all that much. But he really grows up surrounded by that government ethic, which is quite different from a kind of political story, in part because Washington residents during Hoover's lifetime could not vote. Uh, they did not join political parties. And so he's really a creature of that world of government employment, government service. Uh, he's born into it. He spends his whole life in that world and then becomes an architect of it. And the other piece that was really fascinating to me about Washington as a city that I think shaped Hoover in pretty profound ways is that it was a city that was undergoing racial segregation during the years that he was coming of age. So he grew up in mostly segregated institutions. He went to the Washington public schools, which were segregated. Um, he went to George Washington University, stayed in the city for law school, and uh, that was segregated as well. And while he was at GW, um, he joined a kind of of white Southern fraternity called Kappa Alpha that was just immersed in kind of a world of segregationist politics, a kind of romanticism about the lost cause of the white South and the Confederacy. And those two pieces, this kind of progressive ethos and then this, this deep conservatism, particularly around race, stay with him for his whole career. And I think he really builds the FBI uh, modeled on both of those forces that, that he encountered as a young man. Well, obviously there was a, a long journey to be the head of the FBI, but I'm sure- Shorter than you would think, but- <laughs> <laughs> Well, not, not, he didn't move around, but um, in terms of when you think about, he would, wanted to be a reformer and was progressive in some of his ideas at times. And when we look back on it, how we sometimes see history as, is a little bit different, I think. What do you think his goals were for the organization, for the FBI? I think he understood the FBI as sort of the frontline defense of the American way of life and of the social order. Um, and so that's a place that his conservatism and his kind of progressive good government ethos really came together. He built the FBI as a defensive organization. That meant that it was the front line against uh, the criminal element, as he would have described it. And it was also the front line against a variety of political threats that he understood to be deep, deep causes of concern for the existing political order. For Hoover, the cause of his life was anti-communism. Uh, he got his first job in the Justice Department in 1917, just as the US was entering World War I, but also as the Bolshevik Revolution was happening in Russia. And so he's very shaped by this growing up. A lot of his early work at the Bureau is dedicated to that. And then it becomes one of these big through lines in his career. It seems to me that FDR um, pushes Hoover into domestic surveillance of fascists and communists and, and others during World War II. Is that a correct takeaway from your book? Um, and, and if it is, are there any ironies in that or paradoxes? I think just the fact that FDR really liked J. Edgar Hoover and also is the person who more than anyone in American history 
actually empowered J. Edgar Hoover is surprising to a lot of people. FDR, we tend to think of as our great liberal president, uh, Hoover as this kind of deep-rooted conservative, certainly by the end of his career, although I would argue throughout it as well. Uh, but it is true that Franklin Roosevelt pushed the FBI into a much more expansive role in criminal law enforcement. He pushed Hoover into publicity and public relations, which Hoover became very, very successful at. And then, as you say, he pushed Hoover and the FBI into a much more expansive role in domestic political policing, first against fascists and communists, um, later focusing a little more on communists than on fascists, and then by the 1960s on a whole host of uh, movements, really all from this directive that, that Franklin Roosevelt provided in the 30s. So I feel in recent years, we are we are more so uncovering more stories of American history. I was specifically interested that you write about Hoover and some of his experiences um, with German internment in World War I, but that he was opposed to Japanese internment, at least that was my interpretation. Um, and I, I didn't know if you could talk a little bit about why. why. That's exactly right. His first job when he was hired into the Justice Department in 1917, as the United States was going into World War I, was to help manage German internment and German registration, which were two parallel programs that we've tended to, to forget about, but were very significant at the time. This was not mass internment in the way that Japanese internment became mass internment during the First World War. This was you know, a set of pretty subjective and often quite questionable judgments about who seemed dangerous, uh, and then those people, all uh, non-citizens, uh, people of German birth were, were often thrown into internment camps. Uh, several thousand people were interned. So Hoover both, I think, learned from that experience uh, this, um, sense of being empowered to make these judgments about who was dangerous to the United States, and then also learned uh, how hard it was to actually do this well. There was lots of controversy, lots of inefficiency, um, lots of pushback against the German internment program, which was not very well run, um, even if uh, one might not have wanted a well-run <laughs> internment program from certain points of view. So when the Second World War came along, Hoover was determined to do this very differently. And he began planning for the possibility of internment um, really in 1939, to some degree even earlier, so that when Pearl Harbor came, the FBI went into action and began rounding up uh, people that Hoover had determined were in fact dangerous. Some of those were once again German nationals, some were Italian nationals, and some were Japanese nationals. Uh, so when the idea of mass Japanese internment came along a few years, a uh, few months, sorry, later, in early 1942, Hoover opposed it, both because he thought the internment of American citizens, and that was about half of the people who were interned, uh, was unconstitutional, illegal, ill-advised, and also because he felt we already have a good internment program. It's targeted at specific individuals. And if you want to know who's dangerous, you don't need to intern everyone of Japanese descent, uh, you need to come to us at the FBI and we'll tell you who to worry about. So I'd say it was a combination of a uh, principal experience and, and self-interest. You make a point that Hoover did not run a rogue agency, yet you also admit that he could strong arm people and kind of there's a bit of a dichotomy. If you could talk a little bit about what you were thinking or what you found in your research and what kind of you're the expert what what do you think did he you know did he sometimes go off the rails or was he really using our original documents our nation's original documents as his guide well, I'd say there was some of each. Uh, there's no question that Hoover used two tools very effectively and very much 
uh, outside of scrutiny often um, to promote his own career, uh, often his own political agenda. One of those, as you suggested, was it was was a little bit of strong arming or at least collecting information on powerful people, on all kinds of people, um, and letting them know that he had that information that they might not want disclosed. So Hoover was famous for having files on everybody. Now, he didn't actually have files on everybody, but as long as people think that you might have files on them, then, uh, you know, it has pretty much the same effect. Uh, the other thing that he used to great effect was secrecy. And the FBI, during the time that he was director, had very few safeguards, in part because nobody anticipated um, how big and how powerful it was going to become. And so when Hoover wanted to do something, particularly if it involved forms of political surveillance or disruption uh, that he wasn't sure he had authorization for, he often just did that uh, in secret. And there's an awful lot of that. But I think neither one of those fully explain how he managed to stay in office for so long. And for that, I think you really do have to look to the range of other skills that he had, uh, the popularity of not only Hoover, but the FBI as an institution. Incredibly widespread support in Congress, partly because Hoover staffed congressional committees with FBI agents, their <laughs> investigative staffs often, right? So he had all sorts of skills, his ability to run his own bureaucracy and to hire men who were gonna be loyal to him, right? All of those were really important to his story as well. Well, it's funny because my I wanted to transition and you did it so very perfectly to personal relationships, because I think a lot of his success dealt with. I mean, I, he even gave um, one of our presidents a dog that was named Edgar. Well, right? So um, if we could if you could tell me or share with me, who do you think if you had to pick three of Edgar? Uh, J. Edgar Hoover's most important relationships during his career. Who are they and why? The first is certainly Clyde Tolson, who was a bureau official, the number two man at the FBI for most of Hoover's life and career, but was also really Hoover's companion, um, his most intimate relationship uh, the man with whom he did not technically live with Tolson, but they did just about everything else together. They had their meals together. They traveled together. Uh, they stood up for each other at things like family funerals, um, in addition to working side by side all day long. So, of course, the great question of Tolson is what kind of relationship was this? Um, you know, and the book spends a lot of time thinking about that question. Uh, I think it's quite clear that they loved each other, they viewed each other as uh, the other's deepest and most important companion. Whether or not it was a sexual relationship, you know, we, we just don't quite know that. Um, but there is a lot of complexity and a lot of really interesting historical material about that relationship, which was surprisingly open uh, in the city of Washington, right? If you were going to invite Hoover to dinner, you were also probably going to invite Clyde. Uh, so among the people who did that were, I would say, the two other relationships that really fascinated me the most, which were the last two presidents that Hoover served under, Lyndon Johnson, who got the dog, <laughs> and Richard Nixon. And those are interesting relationships, in part because they started so long before either one of those men became president. Hoover got to know both of them while they were in Congress in the 1940s. Lyndon Johnson lived on his street, so they were neighbors, and they walked their dogs together, so that was the dog connection. Um, and Nixon, he got to know through really anti-communist politics, got very close to Nixon when Nixon was uh, vice president in the 1950s. Um, and so in all of these cases, you know, you've got a social relationship, you've got a kind of political power relationship. And what's fascinating is that I think it does illustrate Hoover's ability to be so many different things to different kinds of people. Because if we're just looking at this in terms of ideology, politics, parties, Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon look pretty different. Uh, but 
through the lens of Hoover, they, they had somewhat similar relationships and they both really used him and, and, and found, you know, value for better and for worse um, in, in cooperating with Hoover. They all had dogs. No. <laughs> That's right. I don't know if Nixon had dogs. Oh, we had checkers for sure, but that was a gift. <laughs> um, if you're just joining us, my name is Heather Marie Montia. It is my honor to be here with the 2023 Pulitzer Prize winning author and biography, Beverly Gage, who wrote G-Man, J. Edgar Hoover, and, make, and the making of American Sanctuary. Welcome back. Back to the conversation. Um, okay, so you seem to allude to the fact that if Hoover retired in the late 1950s, instead of getting a lifetime appointment, that he might be regarded as the single most important or most popular figure in American history. Um, at least that was my interpretation. If you could um, ex expand on that a little bit, why do you feel that way? You know, obviously there's an extra 22 years um, in between, or excuse me, an extra uh, decade in between where things changed. And I know it deals with a lot of the, the crime fighting and the domestic surveillance. Um, but if, if we could maybe just go down that road a little bit and then talk about other things that I really love, like research and process and your favorite library and all of that. But I'm really curious at this thought of, you know, um, growing up, I used to watch Seinfeld and George Costanza always would want to leave at the, like when things were going really well, right? And leave at the up point. And I wonder if kind of like, did he overstay his welcome or not? Is, is this country just, um, did we go through things? Um, and we're, we're, and he was there and he was doing things that had to be done, even if they weren't popular. I think he did overstay his welcome in, in lots of ways. I'm not sure I said he would be the most popular figure in all of American history, but I did say he would be much more popular One. than he <laughs> is, uh, which is not popular uh, really at all. But one of the things that surprised me when I was working on the book was in fact looking at public opinion polls in the 1950s and finding that Hoover was extraordinarily popular. He would get approval ratings in the 70s, 80s, 90 percentiles. And that is so deeply contrary to how we tend to think about him today that I thought there was something really interesting to explain. I think in the 50s, Hoover stood for things that were pretty widely popular in the United States, anti-communism above all. You know, some people at the time, and certainly in retrospect, we might look back, criticize his methods, and I think rightly so. But even when those methods were known in the 1950s, in the early years of the Cold War, Almost everyone in American politics considered themselves an anti-communist of one sort or another. And so being one of the great icons of that view made Hoover enormously popular. Whereas in the 1960s, not only did the FBI's violations, uh, I think, expand pretty dramatically, especially through a program called COINTELPRO, which I talk a lot about, but Hoover really began attacking movements and organizations that had a lot more currency in American life, even if they were controversial. Attacking the civil rights movement, attacking a figure like Martin Luther King, um, attacking liberals in general to some degree, attacking the student left, attacking the anti-war movement, right? And these were are not kind of marginal institutions in the way that the Communist Party, even at the height of its power, had been. Uh, they they had a lot more a lot more grounding. Um, and I think the other thing that happened in in the '60s and then expanded in decades that followed is uh, that the political parties began to began to shift. Right. And there were fewer points of consensus as the decade went along. And I think in many ways, Hoover really represented a certain kind of mid-century Washington consensus, a faith in federal power, a faith in kind of authority figures. And a lot of that changes both on the left and the right in the, in the 1960s and 70s. 
I read that Hoover is the only civilian government administrator to lie in state at the U.S. Capitol. From that moment to now, his legacy has has changed quite a bit. Um, does his shadow still hang over the FBI? I think that it does. It, when the FBI goes to work, they're still walking into the J. Edgar Hoover building, although that may change in years to come, uh, both because there are some questions and some pressure um, to take Hoover's name off the building, more likely because they're just going to get rid of that building <laughs> and open a new headquarters, um, either in Maryland or Virginia. But even once Hoover's name is gone, I think it's very much an institution uh, that that he built and that bears his stamp. You know, the strange combination of things that the FBI does, which is on one hand, uh, criminal law enforcement, and on the other hand, intelligence work, right? Those both come out of the Hoover era. Many of the things that the FBI is most famous for, its lab, its forensics, that again uh, comes out of the Hoover era. And I think most importantly, maybe the, the culture of the FBI, I think still bears the stamp of both aspects of Hoover's worldview, you know, on the one hand, a real pride in kind of professional, nonpartisan, expert government service, just finding the facts. And on the other hand, a, a pretty deep conservatism in lots of ways to the FBI's uh, internal culture. So all of that, I think, uh, can be traced back to Hoover, even though the FBI looks like and is in many ways a much more accountable and much more diverse um, and much more, I would say, uh, in, in many cases, much more law abiding <laughs> uh, institution than it, than it was under Hoover. Do you, you've spoken a little bit about the future of the FBI from a new building to, I mean, where do you, we're in a very global space, but our nation certainly has borders. <laughs> um, where do you th think things will go from here? Well, I think there are two things that are really sort of interesting about the politics of, of the FBI at the moment as compared to in Hoover's day. Uh, so one is incredible continuity, right? The FBI is under all sorts of political pressure in the moment because while it's supposed to be uh, a nonpartisan, just the facts kind of institution, uh, structurally, this was true in Hoover's day, it's true now, they're constantly being pulled into incredibly controversial political investigations. Right? This really came to a head during the Trump years, but has been true for a long time. Um, and so I think Hoover would really recognize that dilemma that the FBI is in now, and they're in a very tough spot at the moment um, in terms of uh, being accused of playing politics. I think one big contrast from Hoover's life, uh, but particularly from his final years and the years after his death, is that it used to be liberals and Democrats who were the most critical of the FBI, certainly people on the left, uh, conservatives and Republicans used to be great champions of the FBI, you know, certainly during the Reagan years. And now, of course, a lot of the attacks on the Bureau are coming from the right, they're coming from the Republican Party, and that looks radically different than it, than it would have looked even, even just a, a couple of decades ago. Well, this has been incredible, and you've shared so much knowledge with all of us today. I'm interested a little bit, I mean, you, you alluded to the extensive research um, you, you did, in, and for an 800-page book, I can it must have been extensive research. What was your process? How did you go about it? How did you keep it all straight? Um, if you could, you know, did you have a favorite library either that you worked in or that you visited? Can you talk a little bit about all of that? Well, without going into incredibly nerdy detail about what database program I use and all of that, I, I'll, I'll say a couple of things. Um, one is that I didn't write the book in order. Um, I left for myself the parts that I was most interested in, uh, the parts that really animated me. It turned out I was interested in pretty much everything, but there were certain places that I really wanted to dig in. And I left those to the end so that I could sort of sustain over this enormously long period of time, uh, more than a decade working on it. 
Uh, I did only use kind of digital files with a few exceptions. So even when I was going to a paper archive, I would take photographs. I thought otherwise I was going to have to build a new wing on my house to house all of the paper. Um, so that was an important part of the process. And then most of the archives that were the most important, the libraries are, are in Washington. Um, so it was the FBI itself. It was the National Archives and it was Hoover's personal papers, which are now uh, in the custody of the National Law Enforcement Museum, which didn't exist actually when I started working on this book. Uh, it was just an idea, but that now exists in downtown Washington. Um, of course, there are some non-libraries, things like the Freedom of Information Act, uh, files that other people have put up online, you know, basic stuff like newspaper reports, census data, all of those things I, I definitely made use of. Um, but I spent a lot of my summers in Washington, D.C. I have photos of my son, who is now 20, as you know, an eight-year-old being forced to pose in front of Hoover's grave in Congressional Cemetery because he would come down on these research trips with me. It builds character, and he'll love you for it later. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, so in terms of audience, right, it's it, there's a really interesting when you think of who you wrote this book for, there's the academy and then there's the general public. When you were writing, who are you writing for? And um, I mean, and can you share about your choice in, in publisher and why you made that decision? From the beginning, I, I really wanted this book to be a book that would speak to both of those audiences and speak to them quite powerfully. And there were moments when I thought, is this just a fantasy? But I'm happy to say, you know, based on uh, kind of the reception that I've gotten both from uh, general readers and from my, my uh, colleagues in the academy, I think, I think that uh, it was effective. Um, yes. You know, I think biography is very useful in certain ways um, because it's a genre that has a public audience. I came to like biography because you know it has a very clear narrative to it and a clear way of kind of making human connections with the past. Sometimes scholars don't like biography as much, but I also thought that Hoover was a very good vehicle for telling a story that's not about an individual, but is it a, a, about a much larger story, both in terms of where he had his fingers, but also in terms of, you know, the state of the scholarship and the historiography. And uh, so I'm happy to say, I think a lot of historians uh, have recognized that um, and have been able to, to make sense of it, even though I hope it's a pretty fun read as well. Yeah, it is. Um, I, I've really enjoyed it. And I, I, um, I know I read a lot, <laughs> but I, and I, at first, I'm sure you have to, it's part of the job. I was intimidated, but then I was like, well, it, it's very readable. It very, it speaks very, very well to, I think, everyone. And I think it is something that people wonder about, right? The, this mythology, this controversial character, and to get a new take uh, on him, it's, it's, it's worth the read for sure. Um, we were put together though because we're celebrating the Library of Congress National Book Festival, which is on this Saturday. Can we expect to see you there? I will be there and I can't imagine a better place, not only because this is a book set in Washington, but because J. Edgar Hoover's first government job was actually not at the Justice Department. It was at the Library of Congress. And so we have the Library of Congress to blame for teaching J. Edgar Hoover how to use an effective filing system, how to gather information and make it available. So, um, you know, we'll credit, blame, uh, we'll, we'll leave it to others to decide. But there's a, there's a really powerful connection there. I love that. And you always have to be careful of the power of the librarian. They always know so much, right? <laughs> I think he might be the most famous librarian uh, in all of American history. You can correct, well, you know, we, we could debate a few others, but. <laughs> 
Well, for those of you who are able to get there, remember it's it's just this weekend and it's it's on Saturday, um, August 12th, and it's going to be a fabulous time. So don't miss it. Um, Beverly, this has been such a delightful conversation. I really want to thank you for sharing all of, oh, wait, I know what I did not ask you and I need to. I need to know what we can expect next from you. Have you thought about it at all? Because I am sure after people read this, they're gonna be like, what is she working on? And I'm sure they're gonna to wanna to know. So do you have you taken a break? Are you working on something that you wanna tell us about? Well, a little bit of each. So the, the first thing to say is I'm writing a short book um, because uh, I do have other big projects in mind down the line that are going to be decade long projects. But uh, my next book is a short book. I'm calling it A Road Trip Through U.S. History. And it's um, in advance of 2026 when we are going to be celebrating the 250th anniversary of the United States. The question that's driving me in writing this book is, uh, can we face our past, truly face our past, and still celebrate our country? And to find the answer to that, I am spending the next year or two uh, kind of going to historic sites in the United States, seeing what they're doing, uh, seeing how they're they're telling the story and, and, and reinventing history from the ground up. Well, that's super exciting. And there are lots of things already happening already. Um, and so I'm, I'm looking forward, we should talk more about that offline because, and I think more people will anticipate that book and we can hopefully have you back to discuss it as we approach America 250. So, Thank you once again. Thank you for just being so thorough and doing so much hard work and research. It, you did all the hard work. <laughs> this thank, you, thank you for reading it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so very much. Um, we look forward to getting to see you this weekend. Um, and, and thank you for, for joining us. It's time to close the conversation. I always want to thank my library partners and PBS stations, more than 1,800 strong throughout the country for joining us but we always like to thank you for being here as well. In addition, we just wanna remind you and put up that graphic so you remember to go to loc.gov slash bookfest for more information for any questions you might have. And to remind you that every Wednesday and Thursday and August, you can catch more programs right on pbsbooks.org at LOC Bookfest 23. Until next time, I'm Heather Marie Montilla, and happy reading.